Welcome to all of you today. I am thrilled to be here giving you the message today um, and anxious. So just putting it out there. Your prayers are welcome. Um, I would just want to welcome all of you and even those outside of time and this space, um, those online and those who might be reviewing um, this message. I'm going to give a special welcome to my brother. I just noticed that he slipped in the back, my brother and sister-in-law. Um, they drove from Sioux Falls today, so that's kind of fun. Oh. <laughs> um, would you please open up your Bibles with me to Colossians chapter 1? We're just going to jump right in. There's a heat advisory today, right? <laughs> so we're just going to jump right in and get to it. Um, Colossians chapter 1. And by the way, if you don't own your own Bible, please stop back at our church, sanctuary, our church at 1010 Julia. We would gladly give you a Bible if you don't have the word to regularly open in your home or if you would like one in your desk drawer at work. Um, you would certainly um, be welcome to have one of our Bibles from church. So um, as we read this scripture, would you please stand? if you're able, for the public reading of God's word. This is Colossians chapter 1. You can find me at verse 9 through 12. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And you may be seated. And join me in a word of prayer, please. Father God, thank you for our freedom to gather today in Jesus' name and to offer our worship to you. What a privilege to gather with our family of believers and seekers to raise the name of Jesus. Look to his example. Learn more of him. Filter this knowledge through our daily living and live in Christ-likeness. Thank you for this assembly of souls, and speak to us, Lord, through your spirit. Would you calm people in this moment, myself included, who are anxious and worried? Father, grant us peace that passes all understanding, so we can calmly sit and soak in the riches of your love through this time of worship, and then that we would go in this peace to live lives of peace and love to others in the name of Jesus. God, would you bless this community. Bless Good News, Okaboji and Esterville and our online congregation. Our other churches gathering, kitty corner from here, up in that city, down in that city, over, it, over in those cities. Father, please touch my tongue with your Holy Spirit fire and go forth in this space and light others on fire with the Spirit of God. Amen. Father, bless all generations who are gathered here and that extend behind and in front of us. May the Jesus in us carry on to all people everywhere until we see you face to face. Amen. Uh, my name is Sally Itis, and I'm a local here. Um, I have been attending Good News, and our family has for 25 years. And um, so we are first-generation good newsers in, in terms of generations. I teach a band, middle school band in Spirit Lake, and so that's a, a little bit of context. I'm married to my husband, Dwayne, who was on the drum set this morning. And we have a daughter who's married to Levi um, and a son who lives in Denver, Colorado. Carly and Levi make their home in West Des Moines. I'm so excited to be with you today in spirit and truth to offer our worship to Jesus Christ our Lord and to bring this word to you. Um, 
I did sleep more hours last night than I didn't, but let me tell you, I lost some sleep last night, and I've already delivered this message over in Esterville last week, so I shouldn't be nervous at all, but there's something, there's something new and fresh that God wants to do today, and I hope you're ready for it. If you can just imagine with me, Paul's task to the first century church, he's birthing the church. Well, Jesus birthed it, but Paul is, is spreading it. He's going. He's, he's wanting the message of Jesus Christ to be known in all the world. I don't know if Paul would have read Matthew's notes, but in the book of Matthew, there is a scripture that says, Matthew chapter 7, 13 and 14, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. And I think, I think Paul wanted to make sure that the people of Colossae knew the truth that they, don't, that they don't think that the fences go down and y'all come in and you can just, you know, be a church in any way you want. That's not the church of Jesus Christ. Paul can't write a letter telling these people to refer to the book of Romans, chapter 12, you know. Um, he can't do that. It's not written yet. The, the New Testament won't be written for 400 years yet. That's a lot of generations. But this book, this book of Colossians, is like the first draft of what becomes the New Testament. Paul is amazing in writing to the people of his knowledge of Christ and what that means to him. Paul perhaps has met some of the believers in Colossae, but as they add to their church, there are many people he hasn't met or who don't know him. Paul knows of the power of Christ's spirit left to us. And through prayer, all spiritual needs can be taken care of. All physical needs met and all mental and emotional health healed. Paul knows what it is to pray without ceasing. Do we know what it is to pray without ceasing? To never give up. To, to pursue, to press on in prayer that relationship with our God. Paul and Timothy are praying without ceasing, and toward the end of the book of Colossians, we're told that Paul has others, others that he's meeting with, others that he is preparing to go out and deliver this gospel. And Paul and Timothy, in, in particular here in this section of Scripture, are praying without ceasing. Matthew 18, verse 20 for where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. In Jesus' name, he is present with them. So the new birth of this church, Paul prays for life to be grown in all the power and glory of the Holy Spirit. Exclamation point, exclamation point. Paul and Timothy know that it is the Spirit of God that touched them and that can reach through the miles and through the, the boundaries, through the country lines, through the nations, that it is by the power and the glory of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name that all people everywhere can be reached. I know that many times we mistakenly say, and I do, I do say this with all sincerity, I hear people say, I believe in the power of prayer. And that's okay, but I don't believe in the power of prayer because that puts prayer power in my words. I believe in the power of God inhabiting my prayers. Can I get an amen? I believe in the power of prayer through Jesus Christ inhabiting my prayers and the Holy Spirit. And, and that God gets to do what God's going to do, right? God gets to do it. He gets the glory. He gets the decisions. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, always for our own good. It's this kind of prayer for a precious, vulnerable new life 
that Paul and Timothy are hearing about and raising up in prayer to a God who birthed it. This is an infant church. This is, this is Christianity in all infancy. I occasionally throw, scroll through Facebook. Is anyone with me on this? Anyone Facebookers? Yeah, I'm, I know you're out there. Um, especially when my husband is watching the twins for the umpteenth hour of the week and I'm trying to distract myself. But, you know, if I'm scrolling through Facebook, I have a lot of friends and family that I need to keep up with. It's really important work that I'm doing there. I have four sisters and a brother, and they all have families and kids, and it goes on and on, and I want to stay connected. But sometimes, you know, I will be so engrossed in it, I can't even hear Dwayne talking to me. Hello? Is anybody in there? McFly, McFly. Anyway, so while um, I can be in the same room with Dwayne, it's like I'm in a coffee shop with my sister as I hear about her weekend. So um, about 10 days ago, my sister posted um, a post on Facebook that I am going to bring you here today. Um, her daughter and husband went away for refilling for the weekend. And so Nana went to their town, to their home, and stayed with her three grandchildren. My sister posted this photo on Facebook. Masterpiece, right? And she types the conversation that goes with it. From our little Cora, two and a half years old, Nana says, what does this say, Cora? Cora says, dear God. Nana says, why did you write to God? Cora says, I can tell him anything. So precious. Inspiration from my great niece, Cora. Dear God, I can tell him anything. How does little two and a half year old Cora know this truth? In Colossians, Paul is praying for his family, those whom he knows and those whom he hasn't yet met. Paul and the other apostles carry the gospel of Jesus inside them. They were lit at Pentecost with the power of the Holy Spirit. The message of Christ can only move forward by the messengers who walk forward and tell of Christ Jesus. Paul's legacy is now 2,000 years into the future. That's 700 to 1,000 generations of believers. Do you think Paul could have even imagined us here today? Do you think he could even imagine that that what he was lit on fire to do would carry through to a thousand generations. And those people of Colossae and their families, that it would carry through a thousand generations. Little Cora knows about God because of the unceasing prayers and messages told her from her loving parents. She can't read... But Jody, if you'll flash that, that picture back up of the scribbles. She didn't learn this by reading the Bible, but she obviously can write in tongues. Her and God have some kind of language going on, and, and she's telling him all about her big brother who is annoying her, her little brother who is, you know, getting in her way. Um, who knows what she's complaining about. Not being able to eat ice cream at 10 a.m., we don't know. She and God have a relationship. She is blessed by an indwelling of the Holy Spirit from the prayers of those who walked before her. As our scripture says, verse 10, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Her mommy and daddy, her nanas and papas, her great-grandparents, and great-great-grandma Cora, who, yes, bears the same name. I pray that that message, alive in little Cora, that knowledge of a personal God who she can tell anything to, carries her through her whole life. Jesus, nothing else, that we can tell anything to. Do you remember when you were a spiritual infant? 
Do you remember when you were saved by grace through faith? Are you walking in a manner worthy of the Lord? If they who are called by my name, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, will humble themselves and pray, then I will hear them from heaven and answer them and heal their land. How are we worthy of this kind of attention by our Lord in prayer? How can the king of multiple universes hear my prayers? How am I worthy of entering into a relationship of the ginormous God, but then the God who sits with me? By God's grace, we are called, and we were bought at a high price. A life was given for mine, and I am a temple of the Holy Spirit in me, because of the unceasing prayers of my family before me, the prayers of Cora's great-great-grandma Cora, who believed in Jesus as her Savior, the one who could protect, teach, care for her family for generations to come. On 9-11, and most of us know that as Patriot's Day, on 9-11, Todd Beamer, a loving dad, husband, son, brother, co-worker, and now national hero gave his life in a hijacked plane with the words, let's roll. He led the charge with three other men armed with only their fists, improvised weapons, broken bottles, pens, and some breakfast cutlery. Todd Beamer led a charge against evil and they laid down their lives that day 44 in all, but also saved countless lives as the plane they were on on 9-11 was certainly headed for the White House or the Capitol before it crashed into a Pennsylvania field. This is a modern-day John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Why do we forget that? Todd Beamer's children don't get him today. They don't get to go to church with him. But Todd Beamer knew his Lord and Savior, and he knew that if he was going to go down and die, he was going to go down saving others because that's Jesus inside, lifesaver. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Paul prays that we be, in verse 9, filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom, understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. I believe Paul prayed for all people of all time in those amazing words from first-generation Christians at Colossae to Good News in Esterville and Okaboji to Todd Beamer, who joined with those people in that plane asking for the Lord's presence by praying the Lord's prayer before those words, let's roll. How awesome is it to be prayed for? I know that I know that I know that I have always been prayed for to an almighty God. I'm here today because of those prayers. My parents, my dad being the first heavenly father I ever knew, he taught me to pray. And by the way, my own happy Father's Day, I want, to, I want to say that several times today because we have a Father in heaven and you, fathers, represent fatherhood, loving fatherhood, sometimes through tough love to your children. My grandparents had an unwavering faith that God will never leave nor forsake me in any situation in any stupid thing that is my fault or intentional sin. You see, little two-and-a-half-year-old Cora has great-great-grandma Cora, my dad's mother, who prayed in faith for her family without ceasing. Little Cora is the direct result of a legacy of prayers. Generations. She is the fifth generation that I'm connecting here today. You're sitting in generations. 
I'm sure of it. What an awesome thing that we get to do. Pray with an out ceasing for our legacy. However, my grandma Cora wasn't in the pulpit like I am today. She didn't have a wireless mic and an audience. My grandma Cora sat in circle with a tea set in her lap with tasty coffee cake and a demitasse of very weak coffee. She studied the Bible and prayed with others. She brought her family up with spiritual foundation. Give that gift to your kids. Let them know that they are something, that they have something. This is who my family is. This is what we represent. This is how we go through life. Faith like Paul to pray without ceasing. And we lead ordinary lives with our ordinary struggles. I mean, great grandma Cora knew a lot of stuff. She knew pain and heartache. She knew separation from her children. She knew job loss. She prayed for addiction. She prayed for divorce. She prayed about homosexuality. She prayed about interracial marriages. These items that are familiar to us today, animosity, terminal illness, were all things that are common threads in our family. Her prayers didn't eliminate the struggles of the world, but I can't imagine what the struggles of the world would be like without those prayers. She was born prior to the year 1900 which made some of those items heart-wrenching for her. I imagine she wrestled with God over those. And look, look at the fruit. Look at the fruit. I know God. I can tell him anything. I know it's Father's Day, and I'm, I'm you know, feeling a burden on my heart to challenge the women today. Ladies, we're not limited to meeting in circle with weak coffee. No, we have blogs and leadership roles, and we have lattes with three shots of espresso. <laughs> yeah, girl. It's time to set an example and fight for our families. You can get on your knees if you want to. I seldom pray on my knees, and if I do, my good friend Barbie taught me you can put a pillow down there and get on your knees. Are you going to make time to pray? The world is not going to carve it out for you. You know, I'm a teacher, so at school we have what we call deer time. Drop everything and read. D-E-A-R, deer. Drop everything and read. Wouldn't it be awesome if we all committed to a deep time? Drop everything and pray. Every day without ceasing, every morning, every night. Time with our Lord and Savior Jesus to receive all this from our scripture today so we can walk knowing that we're worthy, knowing that we're pleasing to God, knowing that we're bearing fruit and increasing in knowledge, that we're strengthened, having endurance, and being patient with joy and thanksgiving. We have an example to set for others every day. You know, um, I teach band, and so um, we do marching band twice a year, in the fall and in the spring. And um, we are local celebrities when the band gets outside because we go by the elementary and the preschool recess playgrounds. And, and whenever they see us, we're lined up, we're in formation, um, lines and columns, and we're headed down the road. They just come running. They, they drop the soccer ball. They get off the monkey bars, and they come running to the side of the road. And my 7th and 8th graders are always so surprised by that. They're like, wow, they think we're cool. I'm like, you are. You are. And then we just kind of carry on. We go down. 
oh, you know, past Grandpa Dave's over there, and um, we circle around and get back to the school. And by that time, it's the end of the day. It's the last period of the day. So this spring, instead of just getting in formation on our last day of being outside with the band, um, I decided that we would give the recess kids a treat. And so instead of getting information and, walk, and marching by, we um, made an arc, and we played right to them. We just pointed our instruments at them. And, and when the kids are playing in a marching band, once I blow the whistle and once we get started, they can go, you know? So I don't really have to be in front of them waving my arms or anything. So on this particular day, I decided to get behind the recess kids and just kind of take a few pictures and watch their reaction. And pretty soon, while the band is playing, I get a tug on my shirt. The little boy says, don't I know you? I said, mm-hmm. Do you go to my church? Yes, I, I do go to your church. Can I call you grandma? <laughs> yes, Elijah Morrow, you can call me grandma. <laughs> I don't know if it's the hair color or if I've got a few extra wrinkles, but Elijah knows that I go to his church. And he can call me grandma because I'll pray like a grandma for our kids in this church. They're my legacy too. He knows that already. I'm sure he and God have their private language as well. We can't remain stagnant and static and frozen in time. We must engage with Jesus in prayer to grow, moving forward step by step. The Hebrew word for walk is haklaha, which means to go. So when you're walking, you have to go. You're going to get somewhere. Jesus empowers us to go, to walk, step by step. Run if you want. Speed walk for me. I know that my prayers have given superhuman strength to my own children. And the times I know of blow up my faith like the fireworks on the 4th of July. And the times I don't know of that God was there to protect them with his superhuman strength and guardian angels, I don't even want to imagine. It's really important to Duane and I to lift up our kids every single day and throughout the day without ceasing. I know you feel the same. I know you do the same. Whether your kids are healthy and well and thriving or whether they're struggling, whether they have a lifelong debilitating illness they're going to be facing, whether their lives are long or whether they're short, your prayers matter. Find a prayer partner and commit to pray for and with one another regularly and grow as a tiny seed rooted and grounded, or as N.T. Wright says, earthed in Jesus. This message series is called Cultivating a Life, uh, Cultivating Christ Likeness in a Culture of Chaos. I know my days feel chaotic sometimes. I know they, I, sometimes I, when I was an elder, I would come into a leadership team meeting and I would, and you know, we'd kind of check in with each other and they say, how's your day? Frantic. Frantic. I know those of you that served with me understood. Two kids in high school, full-time jobs, extracurricular activities, running, serving the church, cooking, cleaning, all the other. Frantic. We need our deep time. We need to drop everything and pray. We recently, a couple days ago, uh, commemorated D-Day on June 6th. Approximately 200,000 men invaded German-occupied France 
on the beaches of Normandy, France. And as I picture that scene, and I'm preparing this message, I picture the prayers over top, like a dome, like a rainbow. And it was a tragic day, and it was a victorious day. The prayers of the parents, the grandparents, the wives, the sisters, the brothers, the children, the soldiers praying for each other. I'm sure that it was incredible, the spiritual presence there that day. Ladies, women, and girls were called up to join the war effort, right? Rosie the Riveters. We were called up. We, meaning I wasn't even born yet, okay? <laughs> we are the spiritual Rosie the Riveters of our generation. We can do it. Yes, we're going to stiff arm. We're not going to snub our nose to God. We are going to come nose to nose with God in prayer. And we're going to pray everything that's on our heart. And we're going to pray for freedom. We're going to pray for bondage to be broken. We're going to pray for abundant life and health and victorious living for all generations of all time. In Hebrews 12.1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's throw off everything that hinders the sin, yes, my sins that get me all tangled up. Throw that off, and let's run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Yes, we get entangled in sin, but it's Christ in me and me in Christ. I can't keep quiet. I've been emboldened to flex my spiritual muscle and save my family, the one I know today and the one I can't even imagine yet. One step, one day, one prayer at a time. You can do it too. We can do it. Zechariah 4, verses 5 through 7 says, then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. These are important words. Not by might, not by my stiff arm, nor by my power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Paul created the first generations of believers. Now, that's a, that's a tall description of Paul. I'm sure he wouldn't appreciate that. But he was charged with knowing Christ intimately and telling others about him through unceasing prayers. Jody, would you put up the picture of little Cora? She knows God. She tells him anything. Go ye into all the world and preach the name of Jesus, the good news. Go into the future on the wings of prayer. Let's pray. Holy and faithful God, thank you for this message to us today. Thank you for the servants who have gone before us those who we know and those who we don't know. God, I pray that today that there would be decisions made for some to become first-generation Christians to their families. Lord, light them on fire. Raise them to maturity in your word. Bring us to our knees in prayer. Help us to grasp hold of the generations that we're sitting with today or make a phone call or a text and tell them how much they matter. God, we love you. It's in your name that we go. Amen.